uh, we're really starting to explore how temporary and un un unexpected arts and events could shape our experience of the city. So tonight I'm very uh, proud uh, to introduce Helen, Helen Marriage, who will be sharing her amazing work and her ideas for events in the public domain. Um, Ms. Marriage is currently a low fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And in the United Kingdom, uh, she is a co-director of Artichoke, which she founded with Nikki Webb in 2005. Artichoke is one of the United Kingdom's leading independent pr production companies working to transform landscapes and expectations through this unique way of realizing the ambitions of artists and the dreams of the public. Over seven years, Artichoke has produced some of the United Kingdom's most striking large-scale art events, ranging from Royal Deluxe's The Sultan's Elephant, through Anthony Gormley's Fourth Plinth Project, One Another, to Peace Camp by International Theater Director Deborah Warner and Fiona Shaw. And I believe she's going to show you uh, many examples of her work in her presentation. So please join me in welcoming Helen Marriage. Hello. I'm hoping that those of you who are sitting at the back can see the screen before I start because I will be showing some film and you really might want to move to a better seat in the cinema. Um, no popcorn, I'm afraid, but um, certainly some films. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm, uh, as Marcel said, I'm currently a Loeb Fellow at the GSD and that's given me an extraordinary opportunity to uh, take a year to reflect on the practice of uh, my company and the way in which we work and the things that are issues for us that might not be issues for you, the, the way in which we inhabit the public realm. So I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about my own history and the formation of the company Artichoke, which uh, we founded in 2006. But I started working in the arts um, a very, very long time ago. Um, and as my mother, my mother features in this story quite a lot, she, uh, she's always wished that I would get a proper job. <laughs> and um, I think she thinks I'm sort of clever enough and she's slightly baffled by the fact that I'm always sort of messing about on the edges of things. Um, I messed about for a long time and then I was uh, recruited uh, by the property developers who were developing uh, Canary Wharf. The, they had done your very own World Financial Centre in, in Manhattan. And I was recruited to create an arts programme for that development. That's a very rare thing in Britain because we have no ordinances that say that, you know, public space, private space has to be kept open for the public, but I think that they carried with them the rules and regulations from here and somehow felt obliged to provide entertainment or something for the great British public. Canary Wharf was a very contested site. It was built on the, in the old docks in London and um, on an island called the Isle of Dogs where Henry VIII used to keep his dogs and look at them from across the water at Greenwich Palace. So it has a ton of history and its more recent history is that it's a site where both the old uh, white working class dockers still lived but that there have been successive waves of immigration that have moved into the island from Vietnamese boat people, Chinese people, Jewish, Bengali, layers and layers and layers of people coming into this uh, 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 very now ethnically mixed area and suddenly in the middle of this came um, came Canary Wharf and its 76 acre development designed to be another financial district in London and into the mix of that came me saying hello what do you want me to do here and clearly what the developers wanted was a program that would entertain their office workers because uh, it was some miles outside the centre of London, the transport links were terrible, uh, people whose offices were being moved out there, which were largely financial institutions and newspapers, felt that they were being sent to what they, somebody described to me as social Siberia. And um, I was supposed to entertain them. It seemed to me that there were a whole mass of other things that the programme could do while entertaining them. It could, for instance, make links with the local community and provide an invitation for people to come in to this development, which was seen as private space. It could work with what is the largest community of artists in Europe who live, um, live and work in the east end of London right on the doorstep. It could use the considerable resources that were available to make links with cultural institutions that existed. So the Whitechapel Gallery, which is a very famous old gallery in the East End, the Design Museum, various other people. And it could put Canary Wharf on a kind of visitor culture map so that it was somewhere that visitors to the place 
visitors to London might decide that they wanted to go and see. And I knew that the only way to do all of that simultaneously was to do it outdoors. Because the minute I was asking somebody either to buy a ticket or to sit inside a dedicated art space, and there was one, they built a concert hall, I knew that I was alienating one or other of those visitors because they all come with a different agenda and a different set of expectations. So we began to develop a program, my partner Nikki and I, um, where we explored all the public spaces of, the, of that, what is a tiny city in effect, and I programmed things in the fountains, and I programmed things up the buildings, and on the dock, and all kinds of things. The developers, I have to say, were a bit shocked by this. But what they really loved about it was the fact that they made the front pages of the newspapers, not in the arts sections, not in the reviews, because arts reviewers, as we all know, are terribly um, particular about what they value. But we made the news sections, which for the developers was an extraordinary thing. Many of you will know that um, Olympia in New York at that point then suffered the largest, this is 1992, the largest bankruptcy the world had ever seen. And I was given what in my country is called a P45 and went home with a cheque for £140 and uh, needed to find myself a new job. And so I went to work for a festival in, uh, in the southwest of England in a very sleepy town called Salisbury, which some of you may know. Some of you may not know that you know it, but you may know, for instance, Stonehenge, which is um, a very famous World Heritage Site. This is five or six miles outside the city. And Salisbury Cathedral, famously painted by John Constable. Anybody who's read Lord of the Flies knows that the little schoolboys who are marooned on the desert island were actually the schoolboys from Salisbury Cathedral School. So it's had its place in history. And I arrived in a town which couldn't have been as, it was so different from the east end of London in that it was dominated by the church, the conservative party and the army. And those three institutions in this very sleepy, beautiful place were um, absolutely had a sort of stranglehold on, and their values had a stranglehold on the kind of culture that was acceptable within that city. It's a tiny city, it's 40,000 people. And I was coming into a festival that existed for 21 years and programmed classical music, um, very often by candlelight, and poetry for the over 55s. In my interview, I made a joke about that. Now I am 55. I don't think it's so funny. But at the time, I was saying, really, we have to do something different here. We're not going to jettison the things that you all value, but what we need to do is to create a program that works for more people than just these 5,000 who are coming and going from this festival. And uh, Salisbury, in its own strange way, was very like Canary Wharf in that it was very heavily regulated. There were, if not spoken rules, there were social norms that uh, people um, were expected to adhere to. I've, I'm a bit of a rule breaker, as you may all know. Um, and uh, I was very, I was made very aware of this the first week I was there when I was late. I'm very often late. And I was cycling the wrong way down a one-way street on a Sunday afternoon trying to get to um, an exhibition. And in Salisbury at five o'clock on a, on a Sunday afternoon, there is no traffic. There, there is no traffic. I was soaring down this road at high speed and there was a very sweet looking, sweet looking old lady standing on the pavement who went, my dear, my dear, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> and I said, I, I thought equally sweetly, yes, yes, I know. And she said, I hope you die! <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a really interesting introduction to a place. It took me, and many of you may recognize that sentiment, which is, I will help you if I think you're doing this by mistake, but if I think you're doing it on purpose, there is no punishment that you do not deserve. <laughs> and this became a kind of question for me, which is, did she really mean it? The answer being, of course, no. Did it really matter, since there was no traffic, did it really matter that I was going the wrong way down this street? And whose rules are they that we, that we observe all the time? Who makes these rules and regulations, and for what purpose? So I'm not somebody who thinks there should be no rules. I just think it's really good fun to break them sometimes, just to see what happens. So I was at Salisbury for about seven years, during which time you know the audience grew hugely, the turnover grew hugely, the impact on the town grew hugely. Everybody was very, very pleased. And then you know I just maybe pushed it a bit too hard and kind of 
had to leave. So um, Nikki and I, still soldiering on after 15 years of working together, decided that we would create a company that would produce an event in London that would do the things that we've been doing outdoors, these things that unite people in territories that nobody, nobody owns, that brings people together in the public domain, which is public. It's a place where we all do the same things. We go and buy coffee, we go to the post office, we push our kids in a buggy. And once you can capture that space and turn it into some sort of stage or theatrical environment, what you're doing is providing an invitation for people who would never normally choose to sit next to each other after dark in a venue, having paid £10 for a ticket or however much it costs in Washington, I guess maybe a lot more, and sit and watch something in a kind of isolated place, then, you know, clap, finish, go to dinner, don't talk about it anymore. We were interested in doing work which absolutely broke down those barriers and this question of an invitation, this, this you are welcome, we think you'll never have seen anything like this in your life before and we think you'll love it. You don't have to love it, but you can come and it's free and there are no risks to you. So we knew of the work of this company, French company, uh, theatrical magicians I would call them, called uh, Royal Deluxe, who are based in Nantes in southwest France. And for 20 years I'd been watching their shows and they'd evolved a kind of huge a saga of giants. They would tell stories with these extraordinary giants. And it was obvious to me that while they'd toured all over Europe and they'd been to Africa and South America and they'd even been to China, that they could never come to Britain because we were incapable of doing the things that they needed us to do in order for the show to take place. Um, and then I was thinking, but everybody would love it. Everybody would love this stuff. Somebody has to do it. So I waited for the National Theatre to you know, decide to move out of their building, waited for the Edinburgh Festival to decide to move out of their concert halls. These big organisations with the muscle and the power to make these things happen. And suddenly it became clear to me that nobody was going to do it and that maybe I would give it a whirl. So moving from my sort of utterly marginal, non-aligned, no power base, no money, not even a company, a position with Nikki, we created a shell company and we decided that we were going to invite them to uh, shut down central London for four days. And uh, it became a huge saga. It took five years to negotiate the permissions and five years to raise the money. It was a million and a half pounds, which sounds, I don't know what that sounds like to you. To me, it was a hugely daunting number. But not such an impossible number that I couldn't believe it could be done. But what was really fascinating was trying to achieve this thing where we would close the city for a show um, from a position of absolute weakness. We had, and actually our weakness became our strength. So I'll tell you a little bit about the show. You have to imagine me in a meeting. I used to go to these meetings with the 25 agencies who run central London. So that's everybody from the underground and the bus people and the mayor's office and Westminster City Council and the diplomatic protection service and the royal household and the royal, uh, the horse guards and the foreign office and the arts council and the, everybody you can imagine has their offices in this ceremonial heartland of London because we decided that if we were going to do it, we weren't going to mess about and do it in Greenwich or Barnet or somewhere. We were going to do it in London. And that this event was going to take its place amongst all those many other events that shut down the city. So London shuts itself down roughly one and a half times a month. Uh, you might be surprised to know that, but it shuts itself down for reasons of national importance. So that could be a visit from your president will shut all the streets. It could be England, rarely, I admit, winning some, you know, cricketing event or something. <laughs> the team appear on the top of a bus and everybody, it shuts itself down as it did on Sunday for the London Marathon. It shuts itself down for political demonstrations, for all kinds of things, but never for the arts, because, because why? Because it's not of national significance, because it's not about winning things. It's not about commemoration. It's about a live living culture. So my, my mission was to shut 
London in order that London could accommodate this show and allow the city to become the stage for what I imagined was going to be lots of people who wanted to come see it. In my conversations with those, um, those lovely gentlemen, and they mostly were men and lots of them were in uniform, I used to go to their meetings and say, please may I do this? And they'd say, well, what is it, Helen? And I'd say, well, it's a kind of fairy story about a giant girl who's in a space rocket flying through time and space, and then there's a, and there's a sultan, and he knows, she's, she knows he's following her, and he's commissioned his own time-traveling machine, and it's a 40-foot-high elephant, and carries his concubines and eunuchs. And at this point, you could see their eyes going, this woman is mad. And actually, <laughs> all, they would say, all they would ever say is, why would we do this? Why would we do this? And my mother said to me, my famous mother said, why would anybody let you do that, Helen? <laughs> and what I realize now, I didn't realize when she asked me that very important question, is that in fact there isn't an anybody, and that there isn't a let you. These people who are individuals who work for agencies that are tasked with operating the rules are people who can interpret those rules one way or another. And they can choose to say yes or to say no. And mostly they say no, in my view, because they're frightened of saying yes. Because when I said, please may I do this, to say yes was to allow something to happen that had never been done before, that was promoted by you know, a mad woman with curly hair off the train from darkest Wiltshire with a mobile phone and a clipboard with no significance, no status, no, no institutional backing. And what if that was the wrong decision? And what if that went wrong? And who would take responsibility? And then one day, two and a half years in, to this five-year conversation, I realized I was asking the wrong question. And the please may I was putting those people in a position where they had to take responsibility and they were too frightened because they didn't know what I knew, which was that artistic magic changes people's lives for the better forever. So one day I said, it's happening on the 14th to the 17th of September and I need you to help me. And they said, oh, OK. And suddenly, the woman taking the minutes <coughs> wrote down Sultan's Elephant 14th to 17th of September. And then the minutes would came out from the meeting. I know you, you live in Washington. You must all know about the importance of minutes. <laughs> and it said the Sultan's Elephant 14th to 17th of September. And I went, wow, it's happening now. Because I'd stopped asking the wrong question. So it's a story about a sultan and him following a little girl through time and space. She crashes her rocket. Into, um, into the city. Uh, he's following fast behind her. They then meet up. Um, they spend three or four days, and this we closed London for three or four days, three or four days doing the things that any visitors to London might do. They go to a party, they, she goes on a bus, they hang out in the park. They make really good friends, both with themselves and with the people around them, and then she decides to leave the rocket has been moved to its launch pad, the elephant is distraught, the crowd is distraught, there's a moment of theatrical magic, and she leaves. So this was four days. You're going to get about 10 minutes. I'm going to sit down, and you can watch. elephant yet but what is a lot more exciting is what I'm looking at in front of me it's an upturned rocket it looks like it has planted itself from the sky about 20 foot high this rocket it's uh, nose down in the tarmac there's smoke billowing from underneath this cracked tarmac um, it's a it wooden encased by metal people staring at it at the moment all wondering what on earth is going on
Fabulous. <laughs> totally real. The face of the girl in his suit face is a world face. Is it an innocent face? It's a face I think everyone relates to. She, she's everyone's daughter. is 12 metres high, uh, I think it is about 60 feet long, 5.5 metres wide at the base, and 7.5 metres wide at the widest point. So this is one big elephant, you could say that <laughs> it's the mother of an elephant. everybody. Obviously ourselves as the major funders, working with the Mayor's Office, working with the London Development Agency, working with the Ministry of Defence, working with other government departments, working with Transport for London, you name it, people have been involved. The police, the fire brigades, every single public service in London has had a hand in making this project happen. That's how big it is.
we get. It's fantastic. It's really exciting because we've seen it on the French website. Right. So to come to London, it's made our year. I'm actually in tears and I thought this is ridiculous. I'm crying looking at and then I turned around and somebody else was in tears. <laughs> So just under a year later, to come together for a celebration of culture and of wonder and of magic and of joy is really, really tremendous. And I'm really grateful to Royal Deluxe from France for providing us with that opportunity. The important thing to remember, of course, is that the magic is created by the artists. Their, theirs is the magic, ours is the context. And um, we're producers who... I wrote down as I was watching that again, what did we learn? And I think what we learned was that what we knew, which was that there is a power in an artistic enterprise to change people forever. And the transforming impact of that show is still being seen today. A lot of the stuff that happened in the cultural festival that surrounded the London 2012 Olympics um, happened because of that show, because we proved that the arts were of national significance, that you could do an event that changed things, and that it was important that if you were going to do something that was so extraordinary that it happened in the heart of your, in our case, our capital city. Um, so that day, all the rules were broken. You know, did it matter that the constituents of a giant bomb were a hundred feet from number 10 down the street, as you saw when the rocket appears to take off? Did it matter that unlicensed vehicles were on the streets? Because all of those creatures were big, tractor-driven, diesel-driven machines for which there was no provision in anybody's rule book. Um, did it matter that small children were allowed to swing on the arms of a giant girl with no safety harness? Did it matter that the night before we started, the designer came to see me and said, it just doesn't work, it's not going to go down Haymarket, which is a long, slopey street in London that leads from Piccadilly Circus to Trafalgar Square. And my wonderful head of production, it's not going to go down Haymarket because Haymarket is this shape, it's clambered. And we were sending the elephant down the right-hand side. But he said, it's 12 metres high, Helen. He said, 
a problem because it's French. He said, it leans 20 centimetres at the bottom, it's leaning two metres at the top, it weighs 42 tonnes, it's going to fall over. Did it matter that my wonderful head of production had the mobile phone number of the guy who does the contracting work for Westminster City Council and that he didn't phone anybody he should have phoned? He phoned the contractor and said, can you meet me on site tomorrow morning? We've got a bit of a problem. Did it matter that he said to him, we just need to take out all of these pedestrian crossings and all the railings and the central pavements down this road, five sets from Piccadilly Circus to Trafalgar Square, um, and you need to get it done in six hours. <laughs> <laughs> but did it matter that the guy standing next to him said, oh, I think we might have a bit of a problem with this one because we think this one is sequenced into the whole of um, central London in Oxford, any of these females. It's because, um, if we pull this one out, we're not sure what will happen to traffic in the rest of the centre. Did it matter that we phoned the guy who reprograms traffic lights in London and got them to reprogram them all so that we... Did it matter that I got a £40,000 bill? That mattered. <laughs> but we didn't ask for permission because if we'd asked for permission, they would have had to say no. And I had a show starting the next day. You see a million people on the streets there. And for them, it did not matter at all that we had ripped out the pedestrian crossings without permission. Because... You know, curved road, large elephant, curved road, large elephant, no no public danger. So what I learned in those days as a producer was that you have to take responsibility, you have to make decisions, you have to decide what's important, and then you have to go with your gut. You have to understand that you may be in trouble, but there is a larger purpose, which is this moment of transformation for the public. And also, really importantly for me, for the people that we work with in the cities, the people who are minded to say, why would I do that? And then end up saying, why wouldn't I do that? This is going to be fantastic. And it's that tipping point, that change in personal responsibility that makes these things possible. So I was just very briefly going to talk about one other project that we've done, and then I'm going to stop and the panel. And I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. But I was thinking about this being the NC and about memorials and monuments and that kind of thing. And um, I wanted to introduce you to a project that you may have heard of, which was by the marvellous artist Anthony Gormley, a British sculptor who is very well known. And it, as soon as you say Anthony Gormley in England, everybody goes, this describes one of his huge sculptures, which is the, if somebody's laughing, the Angel of the North, which stands next to the A1 and is a monumental bronze. Anthony only ever works with the human body. And he was asked by the Mayor of London to create a project for London's fourth plinth. So in Trafalgar, has everybody, has anyone been to London? Has anyone been to London? No. Okay, so you've all been to Trafalgar Square because you've all been tourists. <coughs> and you stood there and you've thought, there's Nelson's column. Nelson's on the top of Nelson's column. And then you've thought, you may not even have noticed that there are four plinths in the in Trafalgar Square. Three of them have um, have statues on them. So who can tell me who they are? Who can tell me who any of them are? <laughs> it's the thing about memorials, people just walk past them and don't notice. So the fourth one is empty because nobody wanted to pay for George the Fourth. <laughs> so, so it stayed empty. And um, after a while, there's always an argument. Currently, there's an argument that's saying Margaret Thatcher should be on there. And before that, it was the Queen Mother. And anyway, um, some very interesting people at the Royal Society of Arts commissioned a study and decided that the fourth plinth should become a temporary platform for contemporary art. And every year or so a new piece is put up. I think that some of you may have heard Justine Simons, who runs the programme, speaking about Alison Lapper, um, which was one of the more controversial um, uh, commissions. So Anthony Gormley was commissioned to create a piece and he decided that he wanted to tackle this question of memorialisation and about military generals. And he decided that for 100 days and nights, that's for anyone who's really good at maths, that's 2,400 hours, he would invite the great British public to volunteer to occupy the space one at a time for one hour each. So there were four rules in Anthony's mind, one person at a time, one hour, 
take with you anything you could carry and do nothing illegal. And he kept saying to us, it's very simple. And we were going, it's really not. <laughs> so the plinth is 24 feet up in the air. It's eight feet long and three feet wide, roughly. And it has no edges. And um, we ran this artichoke on behalf of Anthony, produced a piece in which we... Uh, my colleague Nikki invented this incredible website, which was a sort of recruiting engine for people to come and volunteer to occupy that space for an hour. And we, the only other thing that Anthony cared about was that uh, that the piece was representative of the UK, and therefore w all we asked people for when they volunteered was their name and a postcode. And we then took 2,400 hours, divided it into sort of geographical silos. So Northern Ireland got 57 hours and Scotland got, I can't remember, 200 and something because it was all, the divisions were related to the population. London got quite a lot of hours. And then every month we would run a kind of computer lottery, an algorithm would pick people and it would say, you three o'clock in the morning on June the 4th. <laughs> and you absolutely did not get to say, could I do 10? You got to say yes or no. At which point we ended up every month with a set of people who were coming to London to be on the 4th plinth. And I can talk about you know the marketing campaign and all the way in which it worked. But what we did was create an extraordinary community of people who in some way represented Britain in that particular year at that particular time and what we never asked anybody was what they were going to do so for me as a producer it was an incredibly taxing um, thing if you can imagine what you were doing three and a half months ago because that is a hundred days um, 2,400 hours it's like doing 2,400 shows without an interval and of course we it's the longest ever live uh, broadcast a web st we streamed the whole lot on the web so everybody was recorded um, it was broadcast with a 30 second delay in case anyone did do anything illegal or something unfortunate were to happen and the result was this extraordinary catalogue um, of people who were themselves memorialized in a book the archive the British Library has got the archive of the website all the tapes, everything has been memorialized. But the point was to create a living monument. So Tony, do you think we could show the next one? This is much shorter and it gives you just a very brief snapshot of what was a very, very long project. I'm not sure he's supposed to be going up there, maybe a demonstration. Today this could be the greatest day of our lives Get up, get up, get up, get up and lift your head Come on, come on, get up out of bed from death row in Texas. It is everybody's worst nightmare to be executed for a crime they did not commit. I am living that nightmare. This baby died when he was four days old, and that's my son Ellis. Perfectly normal birth, and then when he came home, he died the next day. And that's Alice, my wife. The specialist said people in her condition have a mean life expectancy of five weeks. And that was four weeks ago. 
the idea of paying tribute to just the three members of my family seemed appropriate somehow. As soldiers are brave men and I'm proud of them. Remembering the fallen. Flight Sergeant Edward George Burton. Sergeant Ernest Claude Ibbot. Sergeant James Charles Ford. I'm just going to take the teapot for a walk for a while. It's been cooped up in my bag. Hello! Oh, this so be a pole dancer. Bend the knee. Our own Olympic Games. Are we ready for invisible curling? That's a perfect shot! The slow motion sprint. So many sprinters, you only get six in the real Olympics. This is better. Today this could be the greatest day. Ten minutes. Thank fuck for that. And the world comes alive. And the world comes alive. What do you say? She's dead, you! I am trying, Alan. I am trying. Hello! <laughs> I've done my five minutes. Can I get off now? Ah! This could be the greatest day of our lives. So again, every possible rule broken. You saw the weather, you saw the no harness, you saw the no um, safety regulations, you saw new public nudity, you saw all kinds of things. And what you don't see is... 10 million hits on the website, or a worldwide audience that was completely staggered um, by this thing that just ran. People had it as a little icon on their desktop, and it would just, you know, you might get somebody boring one hour, but completely fascinating the way that the British public decided to take the project to their heart and, um, and really use it in a way that um, was expressive of them. And there were many critics who said that Anthony had created a kind of um, a kind of low life big brother. Do you have big brother here? <laughs> okay, so you know that it was it was voyeuristic. But it actually the thing that was so interesting about it was the contrast of this living, lively, vibrant, extraordinary, creative public expression of individuality in a collective way that was a total contrast to the dead military memorials that surrounded it and this fascination with this worldwide audience uh, constantly tuning in and interacting with people so I think that what we've learned from these projects is the power of art to change things and just to finish we're currently working on a very large project in uh, Northern Ireland in Derry, London Derry the name alone tells you that this is a city with a identity problem and we're creating a festival of light works which will be in probably about 30 to 35 installations that will simultaneously illuminate the dark spaces of that city in the middle of December and we're working in a way to if you think that our work is very often an invitation for people to explore territory with which they're unfamiliar doing that in that particular city is a very big challenge both for us and for the public. And we're hoping that by creating some extraordinary projects, quite a lot of which I've been developing with American artists since I've been here, um, we're going to be able to bring a tiny moment of um, wholeness to a city that is very divided. <laughs>